in the early American Republic, we know that a lot of the founders of the Constitution were influenced by classical thinkers. We know that George Washington was influenced by Cato, who was a great Republican Roman back in the day. But we also know that perhaps the most influential figure on John Adams was Marcus Tullius Cicero. Adams thought of him as an ideal statesman, and he appreciated him as a political theorist as well. In fact, he mentions him several times in his correspondence and in his defense of the constitutions of the United States of America. So today I want to talk to you about Cicero. I want to tell you about who Cicero was. I want to tell you what sort of state he lived in, let's say what sort of political entity he lived in, what sort of political state he thought was most ideal, and then finally why John Adams found him such a compelling figure to include in so many of his writings. So first and foremost, who was Cicero? Well, we want to put C uh, Cicero into the context of Roman history, first and foremost. And Roman history is traditionally broken down into three different time periods. Rome was mythically founded, remember Romulus and Remus and the She-Wolf, yes, around the year 753 BC on the banks of the Tiber River. And Rome's first substantiation was as a kingdom. There were seven kings of Rome. And after the kingdom falls because of the rise of tyranny, Rome establishes a republic. And that's around the year 509 BC. And the republic endures for almost 500 years. It's not until around the year 27 BC that scholars reckon that the Roman Republic has completely given way to the Roman Empire. So where is Cicero in all of this long Roman history? Well, Cicero comes at a very crucial moment. Cicero's life is part of the last generation of the Roman Republic. This is just before Rome transitions or is in the transitional state between a republic to that of an empire and an autocracy. He was born in the year 106 BC. He wasn't born in Rome proper. Um, a lot of you know, good, upstanding patrician Romans were born in the city of Rome. If you wanted to be anybody, you wanted to be from the city itself. But Cicero was born outside in a, in a town, a village called Arpinum. So he was somewhat of an outsider already. And to make things even more difficult for Cicero, he was what people called a new man. No one in his family had ever held the highest political office in the Roman Republic. In fact, we know that his father was kind of bookish and liked to stay at home somewhere dark and do his reading. Cicero was more of the outgoing sort. The Roman Republic, which Cicero was born into, was one which did have some civil strife in it, but to paint with a very broad brush, it was a state controlled by a Senate of people who had been previously elected to public office and a popular assembly that passed laws and served as a court of appeals. Cicero's career within this political framework was impressive. Now, I've already told you he didn't come from Rome proper. I've already said that um, he didn't have any illustrious background. He also wasn't a military man. Usually in ancient Rome, if you wanted to be somebody, you wanted to be a general. That was how you'd get your name out there. Well, Cicero found another way to become popular in ancient Rome, and that was by being an orator and a lawyer. So he would defend all sorts of people, and that would eventually get his name out there and eventually get him elected to office. He was an absolutely fantastic orator. If you want to learn how to lie, go read a speech of Cicero and don't believe any of it. Um, and he was also a prolific writer. In fact, we have more writings from Cicero than from anyone else. We have speeches, we have letters, so we know what he was thinking. And we also have philosophical treatises he wrote, whether they be on Platonic philosophy, Stoic philosophy, on uh, government. We have all these things from him. His career was fantastic. He held every important major office in the Roman Republic at the first age that he was qualified to run for it. Same way we have minimum ages to run for president, senate, et cetera here. There were minimum age requirements in ancient Rome as well. And Cicero managed to win every single one the very first time he tried. So he was impressive. In the year 63 BC, he becomes consul the highest office in the land. He 
very much goes on later on in, uh, in his writings to talk about how he suppresses the Catalinarian conspiracy of the year 63. And this was going to be his crowning achievement. So having come from his rural uh, uh, hometown, rising to the highest office and also quashing uh, a conspiracy to the Roman state. The latter half of his life is a bit of a denouement, shall we say. Afterwards, Cicero lived in a very difficult political environment, which will eventually give way to empire. Some of his associates, you would of course know the name of Julius Caesar, and perhaps the name of Gnaeus Pompeius, also known as Pompey. These two figures would eventually become involved in a civil war that would lead to the downfall of the Republic as Cicero knew it. Cicero would stand by in this political, uh, political battle, the civil war between Pompey and Caesar, and vacillate between whom to support. He eventually gave his support to the wrong man, he gave his support to Pompey, and Pompey, of course, as we all know, lost. But Caesar was a merciful dictator and let Cicero live, and Cicero more or less kept his, uh, you know, kept his mouth shut and stayed off in retirement and just wrote and wrote and wrote and wrote. And that's perhaps one of the things which most influenced John Adams was a treatise that Cicero wrote around this time, just a little bit before the dictatorship of Caesar, called the De Republica, about the Republic. We've already heard that a res publica is the public property, the public concern. And Cicero sat down to explain in dialogue form why he thought the Roman Republic was the most ideal form of state that you could have. The first thing he does is he goes and he analyzes what he considered to be the three pure forms of government. A monarchy, an aristocracy, which if you break that down into the Greek means rule by the best people, small little group, and then finally a pure democracy. He says all of these forms of government have their problems. They all become the worst versions of themselves. If you are a king and you have a kingdom, you will eventually wind up with a tyrant. If you have an aristocracy, you will eventually wind up with an oligarchy, people who've separated themselves out and still manage to control things. And if you have a democracy, you will eventually find yourself in anarchy or have a demagogue rise up and therefore form another tyranny that all these states have their particular problems. He said, now listen, if I had to choose between the three of them, I would choose a monarchy. It has the most chance of uh, doing well. But what I really want to advocate, he said, is a mixed constitution. The best thing that you can have is a mixture of all three of these. So I'm going to quote Cicero himself to tell you what he said. A state should possess an element of regal supremacy. There's your idea of a monarchy. Something else should be assigned and allotted to the authority of aristocrats. And certain affairs should be reserved for the judgment and desires of the masses. That's your democratic element. Such a constitution has, in the first place, a widespread element of equality, which free men cannot long do without. Secondly, perhaps most importantly, for John Adams, it has stability. For although those three original forms easily degenerate into their corrupt versions, that's to say you get a despot from a king, an oligarchy instead of an aristocracy, and a disorganized rabble instead of a democracy. And although those simple forms often change into others, such things rarely happen in a political structure which represents a combination and a judicious mixture. Unless, that is, the politicians are deeply corrupt. He does, he'd leave that little side note. For there's no reason for change in a country where everyone is firmly established in his own place and which has beneath it no corresponding version into which it may suddenly sink and decline. Ah. So here we find something which was clearly appreciated by Adam. We know that in his defense of the constitutions of the United States, one of the things which he advocates is a mixed form of government because it is stable and ensures liberty and freedom. 
am I doing? Three, okay. Um, also, I'd like to add a little coda. Another reason why I think John Adams also appreciated Cicero is not for anything that Cicero actually did. It becomes part of Cicero's uh, characterization as he's presented to antiquity. After the dictatorship of Julius Caesar, Cicero is still alive. Julius Caesar's there, dead in a pool of blood, in the theater of Pompey, and Marcus Tullius Cicero still lives to see that day. Hmm. But in the aftermath of Julius Caesar's assassination, there are various people vying for power, one of whom is a lieutenant of Julius Caesar named Mark Antony. You've probably heard of him. Caesar takes this occasion to come out of retirement, as it were, and delivers a series of damning orations against this man, wants him to be declared a public enemy, describes him as a tyrant who's hell-bent on taking over the Roman Republic. Eventually, a young man by the name of Octavian, who would become Augustus, and Mark Antony found a way to get along. But one of the stipulations of that deal was that Cicero had to go. Cicero was famously assassinated, he was decapitated, and had his hands cut off and displayed in the public forum. It's because of this that Cicero seems to take on more meaning even after his death for those who were advocates of Republican government. As the sort of lone wolf, the man who is willing to do whatever it takes for the cause of Republicanism, even in spite of overwhelming odds and overwhelming power. And John Adams certainly found something to appreciate in that version of Cicero as well. Thank you. Freedom 101 is made possible by generous support from the University of Oklahoma Alumni Association. Freedom 101 is a program of the Institute for the American Constitutional Heritage at the University of Oklahoma. For more videos and podcasts, visit freedom.ou.edu.